In this video, we road test a Linux variant, closely replicating the look and feel of macOS. Hello everyone, and welcome to TechFix Flicks. In this tutorial, we install and take a first look at Elementary OS. Last time in this series, we undertook a tour of Linux FX, also known as Windows FX, which closely replicates the Windows 10 environment in Linux. In the interests of balance, we now turn to a variant more closely resembling macOS, which may be a little unfair to elementary OS, given that it pitches itself as a replacement for both Windows and macOS, although its design philosophy seems to lean more closely toward the Mac. There are other Linux distros which take their cues from macOS, and we should mention Backslash, DeepPin, GMac, Trenta, Zorin, the now discontinued Pear, and possibly others. We'll place links for all of these distros in the written description accompanying this video, and we may well feature some of them in a future tutorial. Before exploring elementary OS, we should once again be clear about what it is and what it isn't. Specifically, it's a Linux variant which closely replicates the visual style of macOS, but that doesn't mean programs designed for macOS will run on it, nor indeed will programs designed for Windows. Only software specifically written for Linux will run on this operating system. Furthermore, file types created on those operating systems will not necessarily be directly accessible under elementary OS. If you'd like to run genuine macOS software within a Windows environment, we've published a series of tutorials which facilitate a clean installation of macOS on VirtualBox for Windows, and we've published a new tutorial for each of the most recent major releases. Again, you'll find links to those tutorials in the written description. Heading to the Elementary OS homepage and scrolling down, we see that its publisher offers a pay what you want model, allowing you to exercise your own discretion here. If you prefer a try before you buy, or an entirely free approach, you can enter zero here, before clicking on the large blue download icon. We are presented with a choice of localized server or magnet download, and we simply click the regular download option to proceed. As ever, experienced users who wish to skip the download and installation instructions can proceed directly to the interface tour by jumping to the timecode shown on screen now. The download commences, and for a complete modern operating system, it's relatively lightweight at 1.4GB. Once the download is complete, we click the upward pointing arrow in Google Chrome, or the equivalent in alternative browsers, which inverts to reveal a menu from which we select the option to show in folder. Here we see the downloaded ISO file. We can write the content of this file to a bootable USB drive, using the method detailed in the tutorial shown on screen now, and use it to install to a physical PC. Or, as will be the case for us, we can use the file directly as the installation media in a virtual machine, running on a physical host, which in our case is a Windows 10 device. With the installation media inserted, we turn on our machine, which detects the media and boots from it, quickly transitioning to the elementary OS logo, before fading through grey to the installation screen. The installation process is very much the standard for a Linux distro, with a colour scheme and presentational polish reminiscent of macOS. As is typical with Linux, we have the option to try the operating system without committing to installation via the live CD environment. We, however, opt for the full installation. We can manually select our keyboard layout, or take advantage of the auto detection feature by clicking Detect Keyboard Layout and pressing Sample Keys as directed. We select UK English to match our localization before clicking to continue. We would suggest leaving tick the option to download updates during the installation process, and you may well also wish to tick the option to install third-party software for graphics and Wi-Fi hardware and additional media formats, before again clicking continue. As we've mentioned, we're using a virtual machine, so for us there are no consequences in allowing the installer to erase the disk. Obviously if you're using a physical machine, with an existing operating system, you may wish to consider your options carefully. For additional security, you may wish to encrypt the new installation, although we opt not to in this instance, as we don't intend to make use of this setup beyond this demonstration. Clicking install now prompts the appearance of a summary of changes to be written to disk, and we again click to continue. We now supply our location, by typing into the box, before again clicking to continue, taking us to the personal data entry screen. Typing our full name in the upper box immediately populates the computer name and username fields, leaving us purely needing to enter a password. 
The installer will evaluate the strength of the password as it's being entered. We are then required to enter our password a second time, by way of confirmation. As our machine is unlikely to be physically accessible to outsiders, we also select the option to log in automatically, saving us from having to enter our password for future logins. Incidentally, we've published tutorials demonstrating automatic login for both Windows and Mac devices, which you can find linked in the written description. Clicking continue initiates the installation, and you can certainly take a few minutes away from the computer as the installation progresses unattended. Once concluded, we are advised of the need to restart the system in order to progress, and we click restart now. Upon restart, it may be necessary to remove the installation media from the drive, and having done so, we are quickly taken to the welcome screen. We'll just zoom out for a moment for those of you using a virtual machine. At this stage we can configure our graphics options by clicking view, then moving across from virtual screen 1 and selecting our desired resolution. We select 1920 by 1080 to match the resolution of this video, and we can only achieve that because our desktop resolution is 3840 by 2160. When selecting a resolution for your virtual machine, do ensure that it's smaller than your native resolution, in order to accommodate it fully in desktop mode, making allowances for upper and lower toolbars, unless you purely intend to run in full screen mode. Now we return to the desktop, and even here we can see a macOS style dock, upper menu bar, colour scheme and fonts, applied consistently across the operating system to great effect. There's a degree of polish here which was absent from Windows FX which we explored recently, even the wallpaper has a hint of macOS gloss. We can skip the welcome screens in full, and the option exists to amend choices from within settings later, but for now, let's follow them through by repeatedly clicking next. Much like the Windows and Mac OS setup, we can turn location services off. Be aware that in this implementation of elementary OS, whilst the colour of the slider changes from blue to grey, its position remained unchanged, which was out of step with the remaining options, and may well have been patched by the time this video is published. Nightlight is a thoughtful feature to reduce eye strain as night time progresses, it's turned off by default, and turning it on both moves and changes the colour of the slider. Housekeeping potentially allows the deletion of temporary files and trashed files, with each option being selected via tick. We'll take a look at App Center shortly, which as you'd expect provides an extensive software library which can be drawn upon to expand beyond the default apps. With that, we're ready to go, and we click Get Started. We now finally see the unobstructed elementary OS desktop. We can see that there are two notifications trying to attract our attention, so let's deal with them first. Clicking the icon with 6 notifications in the dock launches App Center, which is the elementary OS equivalent of the Microsoft Store or Apple's App Store. Much like the App Store, there's a clear mechanism for updating our installed software, and we click Installed. This view will be entirely familiar to macOS users. Here we can clearly see apps requiring updates, and can either deal with them individually or collectively by clicking Update All. Doing so commences the installation process. Once complete, the notification icon disappears, and our installed software is up to date. Now we move to the notification marker on the bell icon, which also relates to the availability of the 6 software updates. As we've already dealt with these updates, we click to clear all notifications, and we're fully caught up. Now we'll take a clockwise tour of the desktop, beginning in the top left with applications, of which there are 15 pre-installed at the time of this video's publication, 9 of which also appear in the dock. We've already partially seen App Center, but let's click it for a further look. Available software is neatly arranged into categories, including accessories, audio, communication, development, education, finance, games, graphics, internet, math, science and engineering, media production, office, system, universal access, video, writing and language. A search facility also allows us to directly access specific content. Later in the video, we'll download and install an additional app via App Center. Calculator is available in both standard and extended configurations. Calendar enables detailed appointment creation, supplementing basic time and date information with local data and mapping, participant details, reminders, and configurable repetition sequences. Themed calendars can be created and customised, and export options are provided. 
camera, which in our case isn't displaying an image due to virtual machine hardware access issues, offers both movie and still shot options. Code is a code or text editor, and here we open a new file to reveal its main interface. Epiphany is Elementary's default browser, which we'll expand to full screen. From the menu bar, we have options to import and export bookmarks, and there's a bookmark icon awaiting content. Our YouTube page opened as we'd expect, and our videos played without difficulty. However, a brief venture onto the wider internet did immediately reveal some missing elements, as the gaps in these pages from StarWars.com illustrate, with one being particularly problematic. Obviously there's an important challenge to be met here in terms of bringing the browser up to modern standards, without which it isn't particularly usable. Files is our gateway to the file system. As was the case with Windows FX, all of the directories are devoid of sample content, so we'll quickly create a new file by right clicking for a menu before naturally selecting new, then empty file. The file appears, awaiting entry of its name, although we simply accept the default by pressing enter. We can double click the file to open it, returning us to the code application which we've previously seen. Here are the right click options for the file, including an opportunity to move it to the rubbish bin. Clicking that option empties the folder, moving our file to the rubbish bin, which we click to open. Unsurprisingly, we find the file there, and we click to empty the bin. Whilst we're here, let's inspect the file system drive, which again reminds us that we're working with Linux rather than macOS or Windows. The Mail app requires our account information in order to get started, and is pre-configured for the largest providers, or can be customised to most types of account. Multitasking view is immediately reminiscent of Windows Virtual Desktops. Music opens with an iTunes style interface, whilst Photos offers straightforward photo management. Screenshot presents the most relevant tools in an immediately accessible and compact manner. There's a great deal to unpack in System Settings, which again bears striking resemblance to the Settings dialog in macOS. Assignment of default and startup apps seems more artfully arranged than the Windows equivalent. There's an artistic selection of quality wallpapers, and we'll put up a short montage now, featuring the complete default collection. An option also exists for importing photos to use as desktop wallpaper. Options for customising the desktop aren't as comprehensive as Windows, and there's certainly a feeling that elementary OS keeps customization quite tightly defined, restricting the scope for variation. This is equally true of the relatively few options for customization of the dock. A welcome feature is the addition of Hot Corners, a feature implemented by Microsoft in Windows 8. Each corner can be customized with one of six commands. Language and formatting options are present and self-explanatory. Notifications can be customised on a per-app basis, closely paralleling the same feature in iOS. From the outset, Elementary OS describes itself as privacy respecting, so we'd fully expect it to deliver here. We see five subcategories under security and privacy, including history, which controls our storage of local usage data, and locking, which locks the machine under defined circumstances. A configurable firewall can also be enabled. We've already seen both housekeeping and location services during initial setup, and these options can be reconfigured here if necessary. Display settings can be adjusted using a quite familiar Linux style menu, and we can also revisit our nightlight choices from setup. We can add or remove keyboard layouts, as well as configure specific keyboard behaviours. Keyboard shortcuts are detailed, again on a per app basis. There are a narrowly defined set of options for clicking and pointing, as well as mouse and touchpad configuration options. By comparison to Windows, there are relatively few options available here, although they're arguably the most important. Power options are equally minimalist, although this certainly simplifies the matter for the novice user. Given that we're running on a virtual machine, we can't comment on the implementation of printer support. If you have any feedback in this area, we'd love to hear from you in the comments. As with our macOS projects, there's a lack of both output and input for sound devices, which we assume is a factor of VirtualBox implementation. We'd certainly appreciate feedback from anyone who's successfully navigated this issue, and this error shouldn't be replicated on a physical machine. We are provided with basic information in relation to our network connection, and VPN support has been implemented, along with proxy server configurations. Connection options for a select few online accounts are implemented, and we've previously seen our email options. 
An exciting option allows us to stream music, videos and photos from elementary OS to other devices on our network, and this NAS-like functionality can be implemented with a single slider. The About box provides information relating to both the operating system and our hardware. We're wondering whether Hera was in tribute to the Greek goddess or our favourite space mom. Date and time options are incredibly straightforward, like many of the other configuration options. Those of you who like to sadistically torture your children have the option to impose screen time limits should you wish, but don't do it because it's evil, and your children can learn so much from computers. Universal access options aren't particularly extensive, with few options listed under audio, typing and keyboard. Whilst we'll forgive a minimalist approach elsewhere in the settings, this is an area where less isn't more, and clearly any and every accessibility boost is very much welcomed. Moving away from settings, our next app is Terminal, which presents the familiar terminal window. The final default app is Video, which unsurprisingly is a video player. Moving to the upper centre of the screen, clicking the date and time reveals a mini calendar and event schedule. Further right, clicking the speaker icon provides details of the track currently playing, as well as basic volume control. The small network icon allows us to toggle our network connection and provides quick access to our network settings. And we've already seen notifications accessible via the bell icon. Whilst we're provided with a respectable set of default apps, we are of course able to supplement this very easily from App Center. Let's imagine we'd like to add a fully featured word processor to the lineup. Having launched App Center, we click the search box and enter Office as our search term. Our results offer LibreOffice Writer, which we briefly touched upon in the Windows FX tutorial. It's offered free via App Center, and we click to download. We're warned that this is a non-curated app, which, whilst not particularly significant, has implications as detailed in the warning. Acknowledging these remarks, we click Install Anyway, triggering a request for authentication. We therefore enter the password created during the initial setup before clicking Authenticate. Upon entry of the password, the download commences. After installation, we can access our newly installed app via the Applications menu. Note now that there are two dots in the lower part of the window, indicating that there are two pages of content here, and clicking the rightmost dot will advance to the second page. LibreOffice Writer, along with related apps, has been installed to the first page, and we click to run it. The icon is placed on the dock, and the splash screen displays, before we're taken to the main interface. We now have immediate access to a free and fully featured modern word processor. Dropping the mouse pointer to the lower part of the screen prompts the appearance of the dock, where right-clicking the LibreOffice Writer icon produces a menu, from which we select the option to keep in dock. The menu disappears, and when we exit LibreOffice Writer, it remains accessible from the dock. Finally, the power icon in the upper right corner presents our lock and power options, from which we select the option to shut down, which we confirm from the dialog which appears, appropriately bringing this tour to a close. We found Elementary OS to be a delight to use, stable in operation with a high degree of polish, consistency and an eye for detail. It's somewhat locked down, particularly in its settings, in much the same way that Mac OS has historically been. This does allow it to focus upon the truly important features, although some may view this as unnecessarily restrictive. The Epiphany browser needs some work to enable it to display a wider range of web content, but that's a minor observation stacked against the overwhelmingly positive impression given by this operating system. Our question of the day goes out to everyone using operating systems with a low market share, and by that we mean anything other than Windows and Mac OS. We want to know why you're swimming outside the mainstream, and what are the benefits and disadvantages of walking the road less travelled. Are you a Linux purist, or do you occasionally stray back to the mainstream? Let us know via the comments. Be sure to check out our back catalogue, and subscribe for our future projects. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you found it useful, please consider subscribing by clicking the logo on screen now. If you'd like to see more, there are two suggestions currently on screen. If you have a better, faster or more economical solution, let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. You're also welcome to follow us on Twitter. Until your next tech fix, goodbye.